Good evening and greetings of peace. My name is Yusuf Ismail and the program you're watching is I Beg to Differ. This program focuses on interactive debate on socio-economic, political, cultural and religious issues affecting us as South Africans and certainly looking, exploring and examining some of the global dominant trends in the international community. Today we look at the relationship between Christianity and Islam from the perspective of a willingness to embrace them described uh, by many particular scholars and certainly analysts. Over the last decade, there has been an intensified interest in developing a thorough theological framework for how Christians and Muslims can relate to one another. This interest has grown in part as a result of an upsurge of militant extremism in recent years, which has resulted in a reactionary responses on a global stage. Furthermore, it has led to some claiming that the future of the world depends on whether we will be able to develop a framework on how the two largest religions in the world can in fact coexist. Well, joining me via Skype to discuss this important and certainly uh, critical issue of our time, I'm joined by Pastor Rudolf Bossoff. Um, Rudolf Bossoff is a well-known friend of mine, a well-known theologian, certainly a lecturer on religious issues and um, certainly quite uh, an expert in, in, in Christian-Muslim uh, relations between each other over the years. Welcome, Rudolf. It's good to have you. Uh, fantastic, Yusuf. Good to be with you. L let me start off with this. At this particular point in time, um, we are told that, you know, according to a Pew Research Forum, Christianity and Islam will make up just about over 60% of the world population by the year 2050, uh, with probably a near parity in numbers. Some would argue estimated 2.8 billion Muslims and, of course, 2.9 billion Christians. These figures, do you by, by and large see them as certainly uh, a nominal uh, framework given by certain analysts, uh, or do you see basically an upsurge in religious dominance in the world over the forthcoming decades? Yes, I, I, I would say the following. I would say that when we look at all the statistics that are out, uh, Christians and Muslims really have a major role to play in the world scene. And uh, I agree with the Pew Research Forum, especially in Africa, we see there's an upsurge in the growth in religion in both contexts. So yes, there, there needs to be a way for Christians and Muslims to have these conversations more frequently. There does, however, seem to be a downsurge in a religious revival, for example, in Europe with the influx of new atheism, and some would argue, certainly even in the United States as well, um, although that's certainly far more conservative than European society. But over the past decades in Europe, there's been a downsurge in religious revival, um, and particularly people moving away from the conventional forms of religious orthodoxy. Yes, the interesting thing is, is that when we look at America specifically, we can see quite clearly that America is not deeming themselves anymore as a Judeo-Christian uh, country. And I would say, unfortunately, with the rise of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, we can already see that Europe at birth, the Americans uh, basically have a, a, a clear decline in any form of religious aptitude. Given the important, given the projections and certainly predictions that many people make, um, the importance of how these religions in fact relate to one another obviously cannot be more adequately overemphasized. Um, and and, and if, you, if you look at a comparative um, analysis of other religions, for example, which are in fact major role players like Hinduism, perhaps to a limited uh, extent Judaism, none of them have the kind of comparative significance um, that Christianity and Islam have on the global stage in terms of influence, in terms of policy making in terms of um, how people view themselves, the trajectory forward. So, 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 so the fact that the, the, these, these are two major role players, um, the, 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 the relationship between these two major faiths haven't always been uh, on, on, on very good terms. Yes, unfortunately, there is a history of violence between uh, both Christianity and Islam. Um, and we need to look at why this, uh, in actual fact, was so. And uh, we can look at things like the Turkish conquest, the Crusades, etc., etc. And we could find quite clearly that there are more socio-political reasons uh, than actual religious religions when it comes to these specific religious issues. But ultimately, we need to find a common ground, and we need to get to a place where we have discussions openly about the past. And uh, there's a lot of things 
on both sides, unfortunately, that are unfortunate. But we need to move with the conversation to the future and also ask the question, how can there be a tolerance and a, a relationship between these two communities that can influence a vast spectrum of the world? Um, the, the, the scholar Miroslav Wolf um, points out, you know, just what you articulated, that this kind of deep chasm existing between both states on both sides of the, of the horizon, so to speak, the chasm of misunderstanding, dislike, hatred actually, you know, flows both ways. But for the most part, I mean, of our day-to-day -day lives, we seem to be, it seems that our communities seem to be okay uh, with viewing each other on the periphery. Uh, but, but for how long this can, in fact, be maintained uh, is increasingly uncertain in the world that we are living in, particularly with all these changes that we are seeing, uh, religion, rise of political dynasties, and, of course, the conflicts that are just increasing by the day. Uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately, we see that there's a dichotomy between uh, religious communities and there's also in the news media a tension created and there's a mentality of us and them that plays a crucial role in the understanding of specific conflicts but what i see globally is there is more of a consciousness of two communities coming together and if i say two communities are not excluding uh, the rampant increase of secularism or even the influx of socioeconomic polar polarities in the world that are basically realizing that for a religious community, the conversation needs to be more uh, about the actual humanity that uh, we find in all civilizations rather than just exploiting communities for their own uh, political and even economic growth. Would you see that um, Christianity has somehow or the other become appropriated by secular worldview? Yes, I think unfortunately in uh, the global uh, arena, I think there is a lot of um, the Enlightenment thinking of the 18th century that have influenced a lot of the um, supernaturalist understandings and temperaments of both uh, Christianity and I would also say uh, a vast number of Western uh, perspectives. And um, unfortunately, uh, that has also included uh, in recent uh, times uh, even some of the uh, attitude on university campuses, uh, there's a gross religious intolerance towards any supernaturalist in any way or form. And uh, we need to, again, uh, re-evaluate and ask ourselves the question, why is that so? The, the current events that you see in the world, I mean, do, do you see it from your side or from the, and when I say you're in a generic sense, from the perspective of Christianity, that Current events in the world, albeit uh, Muslim violence, or perhaps in Africa, uh, you have Christian violence, things like the Lord of Resistance Army, individual individuals that are uh, engaging in acts of sporadic violence. Do you see the fact that current events uh, may take Christians to go back and relive past events? So in other words, there seems to be somehow or the other, the schizophrenic relationship in terms of which people assume that what you see contemporaneous in today's time is merely a mirror of what happened in the past and, and somehow or the other they have this perception that it's one trajectory of continuum that this was how always the relationship existed between both faiths and that creates a dangerous precedent because it presupposes that the relationship between both faiths have always been one conflict and not one of peace absolutely and I think there is a very superficial understanding of history of both faiths. If you go to Christians and you reflect or you even ask them to account for what has taken place in the past, very few can in actual fact articulate exactly what has happened historically. And uh, I think if we do not understand our pasts and if we do not understand how we can relate with one another, and there were instances where uh, both Christians and Muslims have in actual fact lived together in absolute harmony and peace. And... Uh, we also need to reflect on those instances, but ultimately, I would say that the very superficial understanding of both histories in Christianity and Islam, and maybe later we can think about how we can create trust and conversation and show ultimately the pitfalls of history between mm. the two communities. I, I'm just curious to ask you this, um, certainly someone that's knowledgeable as you, is that um, you, to take, for example, the Crusades, um, and, and certainly there's been violence on the Muslim side as well, and there's been condemnation generally. The general scholarly consensus is that there has been condemnation through, you know, our past histories have been lived, wrought with violence and viciousness and wars and so on. But I see recently, more particularly, that there seems to be a new kind of trend 
uh, you can call it historical revisionism within religious literature, within apologetic material. For example, where um, some would argue, um, and I don't know if this kind of view comes from the far right, but some would argue that the Crusades were necessary to the ongoing Muslim expansion that was taking place in Europe, and more so as a kind of a reactionary phase to what has happened. Now, I've come across this kind of idea, albeit very slightly in, um, for example, the late Nabil Quraysh's book. Um, I think he wrote the book called Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward, uh, and the third book, where obviously drawing from other uh, so-called revisionist scholars in the Crusades presents this idea that in actual fact, although we take a position of, um, of um, uh, distancing ourselves from it, in reality, um, it actually was a defensive war. Um, do you see that position as becoming more prevalent um, in mainstream uh, Christian circles? And, 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 and is that in fact healthy for further meaningful engagement and dialogue between us? Absolutely. Unfortunately, we have voices on a, from a specific side that tells us ultimately that, you know, when we evaluate history only through one paradigm, we will only find one source uh, for the problem of violence in both space. Um, I would say that we need to look at the historical context, and if we look at history specifically, we can see that history is incredibly messy. And even if we speak about the expansive empires that have been at war with one another, uh, both from Muslim and Christian crusades, we can see quite clearly that there were different influences, there were different reasons. It were not, in actual fact, uh, it was not always a, uh, a religious uh, uh, mm. attitude that determined, uh, a, in actual fact, all of these expansions. When we go into the history of it, it was vastly political, and it yes. was driven by a political uh, a search for power. Um, the unfortunate thing today is that we've got a, a very, uh, for a lack of a better word, narrow-minded understanding of what different religious texts say uh, concerning uh, the expansion, the violence, and uh, in actual fact how we can put history together. Um, and it is sad to see, and we know that some people came with a broad brush, and um, yes, it's unfortunately just not the right way. Uh, the right means outcome for any given conversation. Yeah, I think that, that, that's an important point because I remember some years back, your colleague, um, possible mentor, John Gilchrist, was telling me the same point that you find that these were, in fact, political wars of conquest and then religion followed in their wake. For example, the Muslim conquest, political conquest of land, uh, Islam went in its wake. Christianity, the same thing. Very much a question of acquisition of property, acquisition of wealth. But Rudolf, I just want you to hold that on the point. I've been told by my producer I have to go for an ad break, and we're going to be back shortly and continue this discussion. We'll be back soon. <laughs> Welcome back to our Beg to Differ. I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail, and today we're discussing the um, rather swept aside but extremely important and critical discussion in terms of how Muslims and Christians, in fact, relate to each other, how these two mighty faiths comprising of probably 2 billion on the Christian side, 1.5 billion on the Muslim side, and the fact that we generally tend to talk past each other. Well, joining me via Skype, I do have once again Rudolf Bosser. Welcome back, Rudolf. Um, just, just when we went for a break, um, we pointed out this issue of, of um, you know, relived memories and, of course, the fear of history or the psychological fear of history uh, stirring, in fact, aggressive energies uh, which often result in violent actions. Um, one, one thing is that um, uh, for me and certainly um, for, the, for a Christian, um, I'm curious to know, I understand that there's certainly theological uh, differences between our faiths. But for, for the Christian side, if I'm a Muslim and I want to know what ticks a Christian off, what would you see as the kind of primary political distrust that a Christian would have towards the Islamic worldview? Yeah, I think currently it, it would be a vast political one. Um, un unfortunately, the majority of our worldviews are determined by current news media, um, and there's a political distrust where we find, for instance, if we look at the American political milieu, where 
leftist groups and entities can vote in for a single man that is an extremely shallow view, and yet they will hold their, their noses and vote for this individual. Um, that unfortunately creates the idea or the understanding that what we perceive in the world today is ultimately that all people um, have the same mindset. And I think painting of a broad ultimately uh, generalized um, from both and also Muslim communities is something that we really have to deal with. Um, not all Christians are intolerant towards Muslims, and not all Muslims are intolerant towards Christians. Um, and in actual fact, if you look at, if we can speak of a South African context, we've got a context where people can coexist and disagree, and they can still have a polite discussion and walk away from it with absolute relationships intact. And that is something that we really learn from globally, world. I think South Africa can really stand for and also give a understanding religious tolerance in both communities. When, when I, for example, go to a store, CNA, and I, and I pick up Joy magazine, I see the constant kind of issue is um, Christian persecution in Muslim countries. Is, is that now the, the, the kind of, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of nuances and there's pros and cons to that, but is that now a constant fear or a, a, a sense of concern, like you had during the, the height of communist Russia, uh, Christians being persecuted, under the red threat. Do you have this, is the same perception amongst mainstream Christianity or possibly just amongst certain charismatic evangelicals that um, this is a, a, a kind of a norm that whenever there are Christians in Muslim countries, inevitably uh, there's going to be some degree of persecution. What, what's your take on that? Yes, when we look at the religious understanding of uh, people specifically in the evangelical world, um, there is an eschatological perspective where there's almost a global expectation of things that have to become worse and infliction that should take place in Christian communities before the second return and the inauguration of Christ's kingdom within this world. That is something that has vastly influenced a lot of Christian literature, uh, especially the Christian attitude surrounding what will happen ultimately at Christ's second return. And um, there is this global understanding Therefore, given that ultimately Christians will definitely be put in a place where they will need to have, well, they will need to prepare themselves as these afflictions increase or persecutions increase, that just points towards a culmination of Christ's second coming. So yes, that is an influence, and yes, there is a a growing fear. For instance, in Africa, where we can see that there's an increase from uh, religious extremists, on, and there's a uh, a global attack, sort of, on the religious freedoms of Christians in specific countries. We, we just look at the bombings in Sri Lanka, we just see what happened in Libya. We just see what, it, what, what is taking place in places like Nigeria. And these are concerns for Christians, but I think uh, what we can do is this we can also come together as communities. And I think sometimes people think that all Muslims are okay with these things taking place in the world. But I know for a fact that there are some Muslims, even in my own immediate community, that are outspoken against these mm. things. And they are saying that this is reflective of normative Islam. And so we need to have a conversation where we can, in actual fact, portray and show the world news media. That well, that, that, that's the point. Sorry to interrupt you, but, but that, is the, that is the point, is that when you see the conflict, when you, when you see the conflict, when you see the violence that is taking place, I don't know whether, it is, I don't know whether it's being used um, as a tool for missionary purposes or whatever the case is, but, but the, 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 the kind of message that I get, and, and I'm talking about not, not certainly from, not from you, but from others around that are probably engaging in evangelical work, is that it seems to me whenever some, a Muslim engages in acts of violence, it is presented within missionary circles as normative, that this is now normative Islam, this is basically Islam. So in other words, people jump on the bandwagon and, and kind of use this in evangelical discourse uh, to basically make or prove a theological point. Uh, do you see that as kind of um, inherently problematic? More particularly is that it doesn't honestly analyze what the underlying political climate or situation may in fact be. Yes, unfortunately, we have people that are incredibly um, clever 
and they know how to uh, make use of all of these different conflicts to you know make a buck or in actual fact to create a form of income for themselves um i just think it it paints with too a broader brush when we look at what is happening in the world i always remind my christian friends that there is currently about 2.8 billion Christ, uh, uh, muslims within the world and if all of them were inherently violent this world would have not existed and therefore we need to ask ourselves the question what is driving this understanding that all muslims um and you will know that there's a author that has written a book the only good muslim is a bad muslim yeah you know what is driving that attitude and that vilification of muslims and from a christian perspective and from a pastoral perspective i would even say how can you reach out in love and in unity to your friend if you believe he's intent towards you is only hostile towards yourself in your own community and lifestyle um there is some deeply problematic of painting with such a broad brush and i hope that something that we can advocate for in christian muslim conversation is to show that both communities are in actual fact strive for the one and same thing and that is to live in absolute trust and absolute peace of one another well said and then to take it to a further level um the religious practices of evangelism and and dawa for example from the muslim perspective would you argue that depending on how they have been conducted or the methodologies that they have been conducted have in fact been a source of tension uh, and violent conflicts in in parts of the world particularly when it degenerates into empty cheap polemics yes i, I would say if we have a conversation to be little or to mute the other or to show how little the other person knows or even if we try to portray somebody in a light where they are ignorant and we are more superior then obviously it will bring more harm than good um and unfortunately there's been conversations from both sides where people have screamed they thought if they shake their fist they thought if they say something with a firm found conviction that that makes a point in itself that they are superior but that is not the point of religious conversation especially what should take place Muslims and Christians in tolerant dialogue i think that when we come together we can disagree or hardly we can di- disagree with great passion but ultimately we have to detach the humanity from the disagreement and not always make it about the person or the individual we should look at the points that have been made and take the points to its own merits what about the justification behind this i see some arguing um Uh, the book of acts act 17 in particular provides some degree of justification for this kind of polemical discourse whereby the, the, the main aim of of the evangelism or, or missionary exercise is not so much preaching the gospel but more particularly showing how false and uh, satanic and evil the other man system is do you see do you see any kind of legitimate justification for that in the book of acts uh looking at for example the example of Paul in Berea and and these other areas where he was traveling But do, 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 do you see uh, because i find i failed to see as an outsider reading the book of acts i failed to see this kind of connection where 99.9% of your missionary work is not so much conveying what you believe or the gospel message but more particularly it's preaching about how wrong the other side is i think unfortunately we find ourselves in a place where if we read acts chapter 17 correctly there is a few principles that we can take from it the first one is that paul in actual fact uses uh, the epicureans and the stoic philosophers own philosophy to describe the fact that you know he is showing not an inclusivism but he's showing that there's an understanding that can grow from our understanding of what a community is living and teaching in from its own beginning and constitutes so paul is using their specific uh, understanding and perspective of the world and he describes uh, in actual fact his own christian witness from that very perspective um i don't see any way of for uh for is belittling or demeaning or taking away from the other religious faiths in actual fact when he starts speaking in acts 17 he he, sh- he tells them uh, this god whom you have erected an altar where you say in him we live move and have our being he says let's work from there let's see who this god is and let's 
show in actual fact what Christians believe from this perspective. So, so Paul is pretty much including um, the good in other religions and he's pointing and uh, he's contextualizing what is spoken. He's bringing it to a place where he can quickly explain his own foundational beliefs without any form of hostility. And I think that it is something that we can learn from that specific context is that we can look at each other's perspectives and adequately describe it and then we can bring the conversation to a point and in act uh, and in actual fact interact with all these different perspectives. So so would you then say that the culture of mockery is more particularly uh, one of a dominant cultural phenomenon? I mean, for example, the First Amendment in the United States um, allows you to say what you want to, to who you want to, more, more than any other system. Well, would you see it's something more inherent in the culture and people are utilizing uh, religion as a source of authority to justify a particular methodology that they employ, that they in fact, it, it is indeed inherent within their own cultural worldview as opposed to scripture itself. I shouldn't say a violation of free speech, but ultimately there is a, a great distortion and the idea that if I vilify the other, it will give more credence to my own perspective and that is not the way in which we can, in actual fact, engage in fruitful conversation from both sides. If we belittle, if we uh, take obscure passages and we try to build videos or clips out of it, it, it will just do more harm than good. And I always ask myself the question, whenever I leave a Muslim context, and I've been welcome, welcomed into that context for any form of conversation, have I left the, pe the people better? Or have I made them bitter? And uh, <laughs> if I've left them bitter, then I've done something wrong. Because in actual fact, if we're going to grow and if we're going to be an example to children and their children's children concerning how this conversation should take place, then we should definitely not do it through, through specific means where we're trying to portray just the obscure, but rather the beautiful. Well, Rudolf, I just want you to hold that. Uh, we will continue this discussion. We have to go for, again to pay our bills, and when we're back, we'll continue this interesting and fascinating discussion. We'll be back shortly. <music> Welcome back to our Beg to Differ, and if you just joined us, we are discussing Muslim-Christian relations, certainly in the 21st century and what it means uh, for all of us and of course the impact on our various faith-based communities. Rob, just talking, just when we went on a break, we did focus on issues of polemics and so on. Um, I, I was just listening in, in, uh, in discussing this, in pre preparing for this discussion. Um, in recent years, and I think um, possibly even in, uh, uh, probably still in practice today, W within missions um, that were sent out to, for example, parts of Africa and, and, and probably parts of Asia, there was this phenomenon, more, uh, more, more prevalent in the past and now, this phenomenon of contextualization. The idea whereby um, someone basically gets immersed into the community to the extent that he becomes very much part and parcel of that community. Um, and, and, then, and then sometimes the, the kind of distinctions between the two individuals and fates become somewhat warped. How, do, how did that in fact arise in, in, in missionary circles as a, as a method of gaining conversions, this whole ocean, a notion of contextualization? And what would, your, uh, what would your church's view and opinion, what would your perspective be on that? Yes, I think ultimately if we believe that we have the truth, we should take it to different communities so it can stand up to all forms of scrutiny. Uh, I think just that there has been a emphasis specifically in Africa on trying to westernize rather than to try to Christianize. In other words, in history we find people coming, for instance, to Africa and they thought if they showed people how to dress and how to eat with a knife and fork that that in actual fact is Christianity. And that is not what we mean with missions at all. Uh, as a point of departure, I think look at the history of Christianity and from a Christian perspective, there's always desire to leave one's community or wherever it's sent or wherever one goes in a better state condition. Uh, that take various aspects of various forms of engagement with a specific community. It could be by increasing, uh, for instance, the economic attitude of a country or 
even uh, the, the literacy of a specific group of people. Um, and the desire is that whatever we do is deeply grounded in the teaching and in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. In other words, Christians will see themselves as disciples and they will see themselves as ones that ultimately go into a specific community to bring the light and the understanding of Christ's teaching to that specific community. Um, unfortunately, you know, in, in history of missions, that has not always been faithfully uh, shown, but it has been faithfully shown in other aspects as well. And we've got various examples, for instance, of communities that have great benefit from the presence of specific Christians that have gone into those communities. Um, and ultimately, uh, that is the of the missionary discourse or the missionary going into different countries is there's a sincere belief that ultimately it should make the world a better place and bring a common unity between mankind um, and not just in cultural also in religious settings as well. But, but the, the, the idea which I understood is that, for example, you'd have a situation in Senegal or parts of Africa where you, you'd have churches that are built but in the form of mosques. Uh, you'd have, for example, missionaries or um, fasting, for example, during the month of Ramadan, um, um, but, 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 but engaging in, in practices which obviously l lend credence to the Christian doctrine and faith. Would you see that form of enterprise as one of deceit in the sense that it, it creates the idea that when you embrace our faith now, there's going to be no cultural uh, barrier in a sense you'd be more comfortable because you come to a church but you'd be sitting on a prayer mat uh, the pulpit would be the form of a mimbar or the mihrab which would be the shape uh, in, in the form of the mosque and and I know in Senegal in Dakar uh, this has happened I, I'm saying it would is that an is that a kind of an honest form of enterprise in terms of wanting to share your faith but doing it underhand in a manner of speaking yes unfortunately we know that you know, again, some of the innovations and some of the evangelical pursuits um, have taken a form where it could be interpreted as being vicarious and even deceptive. And um, I would say that we should always be absolutely upfront and absolutely quite clear as to what the end destination is whenever we go into a specific country or a specific place to bring forth a specific message. I know that some Christians feel that in some countries they are not allowed to practice or even to 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 speak for a, a specific Christian truth, because in that country people um, there is no religious tolerance towards other religious faith and communities. That's what they feel. But I don't think that you can you can really uh, get away from a specific understanding of the gospel and its commands by being deceptive or by making it appear more Muslim um, if, in actual fact, you want to preach to a community or to a specific group of people. Where would the discernment be in terms of correct evangelical and missionary practice? I mean, if, for example, you've got here just a few um, uh, meters away from us, the Durban Christian Center, which, as I understand, is very much, um, I, I may be mistaken, but charismatic. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on speaking in tongues, glossolia, uh, miracle works, people claim to have the kind of miracle crusades um, that are engaged in many of these rural townships. And at the same time, they're engaging in missionary activity. Now, how would that differ from, for example, the type of missionary activity that, um, if I could put it in inverted commas, someone more on the mainstream orthodox uh, perspective would be? Uh, and for an outsider, let's assume Christianity has its end goal of wanting to share the gospel. But then, the, the outsider is confronted with various forms of Christianities. You can have, for example, the Benny Hinn type of crusades. You've got what Franklin Graham is engaging in. Then, of course, you've got the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican going out and setting mission work. Uh, uh, so, so from your perspective, do you see that as, as somewhat counterproductive for you in sharing what you believe to be the truth as opposed to what others are, in fact, engaging in? Yes, unfortunately, again, when we speak about um, some people doing what is known as evangelism, uh, they do it with an agenda. Uh, I'm not to say any specific names, but some individuals will do specific things in crusades, and uh, they'll do it for a specific purpose, but not the purpose of king nor the instruction of Christ. 
Um, I would say that ultimately for me personally, I think that before we need to start converting the world, we should start with ourselves. And that means that there should be an inclusiveness and also a tolerance where we find ourselves in specific communities. In that community, there will always be a diverse uh, understanding of how we practice our faith and how we should into all of the world and perspectives to specific traditions. That should not be done with perception. It should be done with love and clarity and also be done with incredible tolerance, the estimation of peace. Uh, and I would say, when I look at a, for instance, charismatic way of evangelizing, uh, that, that is a very hyphenated form of Christianity. I think uh, it's... Would you see that as wrong? Would you see that as wrong? The, uh, Rudolph, just on that just, point, the, the charismatic uh, form uh, of event... And it should not be that. It should not be so. Uh, I think you look at the specific instruction of Christ. Uh, first of all, the point of his instruction, for instance, from Matthew 28, 19, is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel in his own message. And as a result of that message, there could be certain imperatives. But what we've done some Christian evangelical uh, settings is if we've taken resolve and we've taken certain manifestations, we've taken certain things and we try to preach the Gospels by, by, by just showing uh, that, that constitutes and that is the wrong way around. So in, in a sense it's an atomization of scripture or an atomization of certain scriptural passages and then of course people make a religion and philosophy out of that. Would you see that then as inherently and fundamentally wrong. I mean, take for example, broadly speaking, uh, the charismatic form of evangelism. Would you see that as theologically wrong? I would say that when we look at some of the charismatic ways in which they've depicted the gospel, it is definitely a hyphenated form of Christianity. It is not orthodox uh, in its constitutes and means. Uh, and recently in the news media, we also know of um, some individuals that have taken it to such a degree where they are bordering, well, some of them, them are not, unfortunately, bordering on lunacy. They are lunacy. <laughs> uh, and what they're doing is simply just absolutely uh, wrong uh, and a, a, a misjustice of the application of scripture. Uh, yes, there are certain abuses, and unfortunately, there is, definitely, uh, you know, an emphasis placed on specific passages of scripture, um, and they make those very principles constitutes which they think this is true Christianity when in actual fact it's not so. I think at the end of the day it borders down to the individuals. I think we had a situation where uh, some of these fly-by-night individuals spray doom and apparently communicate with God and the self and I mean bordering on absolute lunacy um, in terms of that but something more uh, pernicious I mean which I see as a well, I mean, you could call them motivational speakers, individuals like Joyce Meyer, the whole notion of the prosperity gospel. How would you understand the prosperity gospel? Because this creates a notion that um, just like the kind of, um, you know, motivational books by John Kehoe and Mike Lipkin, the idea that you can just simply wish for wealth and you become, you know, prosperous. You think I'd put out positive thoughts and so on. Is that damaging to Christian faith? Um, because a large number, in fact, there seems to be more, I see massive um, audiences in some of these gatherings. There's Joyce Meyer, I forget the other more well-known individual, I forget his name, Josh or somebody, I, I, I can't recall his name in the United States. Um, but, but, but this seems to be extremely popular, more specifically over the past two decades. Absolutely, and, and what we found is that Again, it's a hyphenated form of Christianity where the individual is promised if they believe God in a specific sense that it is only their financial um, benefit that will come as a result of this very belief. Um, the unfortunate thing is that it is popular because we've got a desperate need. Uh, for instance, in Africa, where people are living every day, uh, you know, we know the the worklessness and, and, and just the desperation of communities and poverty in Africa. And there's an essential promise that I've in actual fact been made from the prosperity gospel where individual believers are told to believe God hard enough, he will make it worth their wiles. Uh, this is not what we see in Christian scriptures, though. What we see is that there's a clear teaching. You look at the writings of Peter, you look at the writings of Jesus himself. There's the understanding that there should be a, a, a definite, uh, 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 you know, just absolute understanding 
wherever we find ourselves in whatever context, that in actual fact uh, should be done so with great uh, meaning and also without the understanding that we are in it for the fact that we can gain anything from our own religious prescriptions. Um, the unfortunate thing is that the American gospel uh, by Joel Oates, Joyce Meyer, and some even uh, in the Americas is a hyphenated form of Christianity. And I would even say it borders on metaphysical cults. Uh, and also, it is very high pragmatic. So today you pray and you give this love of money towards God, and tomorrow they will be a result because you've searched for them to reap. Uh, and again, we find that that's not what is taught in the Christian scriptures. There is, uh, in the Christian scriptures, a clear teaching uh, given that we should accept all, uh, we should be, in actual fact, um, in a place where we understand it. It's not just about what we can gain, but what we can give. I think that's a name I just missed. I was on the tip of my tongue. Jul Osteen. Um, that's individual, Jul Osteen. But, I mean, surely that has come from somewhere. I mean, it, it is reductionist from somewhere. Would you say that it is a Pentecostal worldview or the charismatic worldview that has given rise to the whole notion of prosperity gospel? Yes. In actual fact, if we look at the roots of the prosperity gospel, the roots are more in the metaphysical cults than anything else. And um, there's this deduction made that ultimately if you uh, follow the laws of God, ultimately you will get God to bring forth the right results for you. Uh, and detached from, for instance, a reform perspective that I'm connected to, there is an absolute understanding, for instance, in the reform perspective, that there is the sovereignty of God. Whatever God decrees, whatever God gives us, both good and evil, uh, we should accept that and embrace that with equal virtue. And ultimately, we should not serve God because we think He can make it worth our while, but we should serve Him because we love Him. Okay. Rob, just hold that thought. I'm going to go for a final ad break. And when we're back, we'll be wrapping up the discussion. We'll see you shortly. <music> Welcome back to our Beg to Differ, and if you just join us, we are now in our final segment uh, discussing the relationship between Christianity and Islam, the impact of Christianity in South African society, and certainly looking at some of the issues that are not uh, too commonly discussed uh, between our faiths, who generally tend to talk past each other. Welcome back, Rudolf. Rudolf, South Africa as a country, as a nation, um, Christianity certainly has been a dominant force in this country for more than 300 years, 400 years, 500 years. Um, the role of the church in South Africa, particularly, um, and certainly in the future and more particularly in the past, um, would I be correct in saying that it was the Calvinistic variety of Christianity that in fact, to a large extent, uh, segmented um, and fermented apartheid, in fact, uh, was utilized by politicians in the past to justify the practice of apartheid and, of course, the political rule in this country. Would you agree with that assessment? Yes. I, I would say if you look at the history of South Africa, unfortunately, again, you had specific people that uh, understood election in a, a specific way where it included only one proportion of the country's uh, people. And they religiously justified their own perspective and that own predilection. Uh, which makes it pretty unfortunate, unfortunately. Why, why? I mean, the question I need to know is why was, the, was there an inherent fear amongst... I mean, certainly there were a number of theologians that were very much part and parcel of the anti-apartheid movement. I mean, one comes to mind, Archbishop Dennis Hurley and so on. But what was there an inherent fear amongst mainstream churches during the heights of apartheid to, for example, open their doors to all race groups or... Uh, speak out from the pulpits about the injustices of the apartheid regime. Um, what was there an inherent fear, or, or what was underlying that silence from the church in the South African context? Yes, uh, from that specific uh, emphasis, I can only but speculate, but ultimately I, I think it is again that desire to control the environment around them and then using a religious perspective to justify their own fears. Uh, I can still remember that 
there is, um, I've read through some of Africa's history, and in part, uh, there is this colonialist mindset, of the, which is prevalent even in churches, where the individual believed that it was their God-given right to rule and reign from a specific perspective, and in doing so, benefit themselves as a result of their own understanding. Uh, but that is simply, again, uh, it is simply not true to the gospel, and it's definitely not the Christian scriptures thought. Again, you have to cut away, and you have to have this atomistic approach to Christianity to, in actual fact, validate such a perspective. What would you say it is unchristian for a Christian missionary to be engaged in some form of political activism? I mean, one thing which comes to mind, one thing which comes to mind, just to stop you, is that um, if you contrast, for example, the South African role of the church to, for example, the whole notion of liberation theology in Latin America. Latin America in the 60s and 70s, you had the Sandinistas, you had the Contras, and a lot of those involved in the liberation struggles were theologians, Latin American theologians. They, in fact, developed the whole uh, liberation theology movement uh, surrounding a lot of the activism that was engaged in. Uh, but, but, but I get the sense that, that, that in mainstream Christian circles, that is viewed as an aberration. In other words, the idea of becoming politically involved in reshaping society is to a certain extent viewed as unchristian based on the idea of render unto God what is God, render unto Caesar what he Caesar's. Uh, would that be correct or uh, is, that, is that basically a misreading of the situation? Yes, unfortunately, again, we, we can see quite clearly that certain individual people use religion for their own political, um, their own political agendas, and, and people, unfortunately, take specific perspectives and roles unknowingly that they, uh, in actual fact, use to, to benefit themselves. But there is a, a movement globally where people uh, get involved in socioeconomic and political issues from a Christian perspective. And maybe in the past there was more of a control surrounding these specific issues. But I would say that today there's definitely a, 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 a up, especially with the younger generation, there's an understanding that, you know, your, your religious constitutes will ultimately influence your political stance. Mm. And you should not try to separate the two. And I'm not talking about the conversation between church and state, which is a valid conversation to have. But ultimately, we cannot escape potentially who we are at the core of our beliefs and our understanding of our neighbor as we uh, look at ourselves. Could we then even contemplate the idea of a Christian government? Or would the idea of separation of church and state make that an impossibility? Because, I mean, for, for, for centuries, you had a, we could call it nominally, a Christian empire under the all-powerful Catholic Church. Uh, some would say that was an aberration to what Christ, in fact, preached. Uh, but but would, would political activism, for example, be an unchristian thing? Yes, again, when we look at Christ, we can see quite clearly he made it absolutely clear that his kingdom is not of this world. Uh, even though when he prays in John 17, for instance, he prays that Christians will be kept in the world, but they will not be taken out of it. So he, he meant for Christianity to have a form of influence uh, politically, but he never really advocated for Christians to, to motivate political understanding of what is happening around them and make that simple agenda of, of his own teaching. Okay. Well, one thing which also maybe probably tickles the nerve of, of Muslims is that the idea that when it comes to support, for example, and certainly there's biases on both our sides. You have Muslims, for example, championing Muslim causes. You've got Christians and probably other religious groups championing um, their own particular cause and whatever the case is. One thing which is common between, for example, three major faiths, Ju Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the nation of Israel, what Israel in fact represents for us, what it means for us, um, the, you know, the, the fact that even though it's called the city of peace, Jerusalem, it's been one of the most violent cities in the world um, over the past uh, few centuries with the conflicts that you see there. The question I want to ask is that, um, why is it that amongst the Christian right, and, and, and we're not just talking about the far right, but I mean, you've got well-known individuals like Michael Brown, as an example. Um, you've got a lot of, you've got people uh, then on the extreme right, people like John Hagee and so on. Why has this, uh, there's been this absolute, to an extent, dominant slavish support for the nation of Israel, for the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, despite the fact 
that it is a secular state, despite the fact that it has the largest gay pride festival probably in the world, and despite the fact that you see regular human rights violations, uh, certainly committed by the Israeli Defense Force, is there this kind of uh, constant support for the state of Israel? Is this kind of a theologically based on the idea that um, th this kind of conflagration in the Middle East will usher the rise of the second coming of Christ? Or, or is there something more sinister at, at a fundamental, deeper level? Is it possible that a lot of these individuals have deep pockets and it's more monetary in terms of their support? W what do you see as a deal going on there? There is a proportion of Christians that hold on to this dispensationalism and Zionism where they connect everything they see around them, not to scripture, uh, but they connect it to the nation of Israel and they believe that we can prophetically deduce and, and even see through the signs of the time what is going to happen in world affairs that will lead up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, that is basically why there's an incredible emphasis on the understanding of Israel, the favoring of Israel, and um, also the support of Israel ultimately. I would just say from a Christian perspective, I know very well Christians within uh, the Palestinian community next to Israel that are persecuted. And Christians don't know that. Yeah, that, that, that's the whole point. There are, there are a lot of Palestinians so that are persecuted. Very, uh, setting themselves. So we need to be very sober when it comes to our understanding of Israel and its place within the world. And we should not ignore uh, injustices and violations of uh, different peoples just because we have a predilection or a specific um, theological emphasis that we want to take from the Christian scriptures which is just one of many perspectives. I will say one thing, though. There is a change in the perspective, and there is a, for lack of a better word, there is a bit of a, a sobering up amongst Christians concerning the place of Israel within the world. And it is because change in the understanding of eschatology, and also it's an understanding that the interpretation of specific texts concerning Israel uh, could not be interpreted as a, a literal interpretation where the nation of Israel uh, should be benefited or venerated in a sense to understand es eschatology. There are other alternatives as well in eschatology and we should healthily pursue those. And, and that, that's an important point that you made is that a large number, there's a large proportion of Palestinian Christians <coughs> that are being persecuted. and. Um, some or the other, all Palestinians are painted either with one religious uh, brush or probably having some sort of allegiance to Hamas or Hezbollah, whatever the case is. But there's a diversity within the Palestinian population. And, and what, what basically um, uh, leaves many of us gobsmacked is the idea that despite the fact that the Palestinian Christian church is indeed persecuted, they silence, they silence from the from the Christian right in the United States, uh, from the, uh, certainly the American establishment, and it seems that this trend uh, has been going on for a number of years, and hopefully, you know, probably with more of a creation of a level of discourse, that basically uh, this, this may change in the, in, the, in the near future, hopefully, in the, in the long term. Uh, Rudolf, our, our relationship, South African Christians and Muslims, I mean, there has certainly been a historical past which has affected all of us, uh, all our communities, um, the laws in this country, uh, certainly the role that each of us have to play. What would your magic ball be over the next, say, 20 years in terms of our relationship, in terms of the level of discussion? Because it seems to me that even within our communities, when we have discussions, we have discussions on theological issues, the crucifixion of Christ, uh, truth or fiction, or uh, Trinity versus the Tawheed. Is the Bible the God's word? Is the Quran God's word? I mean, these, these debates have been going on for decades. It's been uh, exhausted. But we, haven't, we need to take the discussion further beyond this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Because when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, we can see quite clearly that there is a common understanding concerning homosexual behavior, abortion, prostitution, um, sex between unmarried couples. Um, so we need to have conversations more in a broad sense. And we also need to, um, well, in South Africa, we've got a history of communities coming together and having conversations surrounding theological issues. But I do think that we can stand together and have conversations surrounding social issues as well. And if in South Africa, I think that the last census, they said that approximately 8 out of 10 people in South Africa find themselves in one of 
uh, a, or let me rather say, a specific religious community. If eight out of ten people can really stand on specific uh, issues concerning social justice, uh, equality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there's an incredible future of optimism and progress that we can project for our communities in South Africa. Well, Rudolf, on that positive note, uh, I want to thank you for engaging with us. We hope to have more meaningful discussions in the future. And if you've just uh, been watching, you've been watching I Beg to Differ. This program focuses on contemporaneous debate on socioeconomic, political, cultural, religious issues. And join us next week for more intensive debate as we unpack issues and take you to the bottom of the story. Till then, this is Yusuf Ismail, Fawn on behalf of ITV. Good evening, greetings of peace. And if you're traveling, have a safe journey to your final destination. Goodbye. Thank you.